right here. Are you familiar with Dr. Michael Lazar's work on the Septuagint and a lot of the different translations that's come up with the Qumran scrolls and the Dead Sea Scrolls? No, I, I know Michael Heiser, but I have not read his work directly, no. I was going to ask if you had any comment on the 32 <laughs> worldview and the translation there. Did you come across anything in your readings as far as between the different translations of the Septuagint uh, where it talks about 32 and apportioning the nations according to the sons of Israel versus the sons of God? No, I have not come across that. I may know enough to ask the question I may not. So there is a world today of modern scholarship, uh, theological type stuff, I understand, where individuals are saying that the Old Testament gives truths that give us more understanding of New Testament passages. And until we understand the echoes, the nuances, the shadows, the etc of the Old Testament, we can't properly interpret, understand, or obey New Testament passages. This seems to be uh, very popular among denominations and among the theological seminaries and schools of our day, and it seems to be spilling over into the church. So some of those approaches say that until we see the Old Testament for what it is with all of its nuances, we can't possibly begin to understand the New Testament. So somewhere in there, there's a question. Uh, and if you have a response, it appears to me that what some are saying is the New Testament matters less to us than the Old Testament. Well, I won't dive too extensively into that, that question. Um, I will say that of course, the Old Testament and the New Testament are part of the same revelation and part of the same story. So, so we have themes and ideas that are developed in the Old Testament in the sense of the need for salvation, our relationship with God, and, and how we should relate with God, ultimately, that are carried through into the New Testament and developed in light of Christ's sacrifice. So I believe, certainly, that there is a lot of interconnectivity between the, the Testaments, but uh, I, I don't have extensive thoughts on you know, some of these hermeneutical methods at the moment. Alan Bonifay. Uh, that was very interesting, Matt. I really enjoyed that. I think I appreciate the scholarship involved there. Uh, on a practical note, uh, I have read before that the apostles and Jesus, well, Jesus rather, cited the Septuagint about 80% of the time when he quoted from the Old Testament. And the other 20%, he referred to the Hebrew text, which, is, which indicates that modern translation is approved but also somebody needs to know the original to check the modern. Is that a fairly accurate? I would say so. Um, I, I would agree with that. Now, I think there might be a, a little bit more going on with the Gospels because evidence seems to indicate that Jesus spoke primarily Aramaic, not Greek. Uh, and so what we see in, in Jesus' words recorded in the Gospels is already a translation of what he had to say. Um, so it, it's more likely the apostles and the inspired uh, evangelists who chose the translation to best represent what Jesus taught in each case. But as far as what you said on, on using modern translations, I think we need to, we have to, unless everybody's going to learn Hebrew and Greek. And it is important for us to have robust scholarship to understand w really what's going on in the original texts. Greek and Hebrew are very foreign languages to English, and it's, it's not a simple process of, of finding a, a lexicon entry to, to uh, translate a passage. And so yes, we, we do need to have people who are able to, to check these modern translations against the original and, and understand when it is an accurate and when it is an inaccurate translation. Uh, excuse me for my language maybe in how to state this, but it seems to me that this is all ignoring 
that the scripture is God breathed in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament. Now, c could you elaborate on that in a sense? What, 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 what's the I mean, concern? Uh, whether it's Septuagint, whether it's the Hebrew text, what, if it's God breathed, it's God breathed. And th that would be God's interpretation of what the Scripture says. Now we face the difficulty when, when interacting with the God-breathed scriptures in Greek and Hebrew is that we have modern translations today and the apostles had translations in their day that disagreed with each other. And you can't have two disagreeing translations both accurately represent the word of God. And so we have to be careful about how we use translations to make sure that we are reaching back to that original meaning. George Batty. Matthew, I just want to say that you, you wowed me this morning. Um, I've heard five talks already in this study. There are still nine more to go that I haven't heard. And when the study's over and I go home and my kids ask me who did the best, I'm going to say Matthew Schaefer. <laughs> this really, this was a tremendous presentation. Well, thank and you. you did a wonderful job in taking a, a, to me, a very complicated topic and making it understandable and helpful and usable. And my son Nathan told me, he asked me, what's the lineup for the study? And I was going through the lineup and I came to your name. He said, he'll know his stuff. <laughs> and as somebody said, the half has never yet been told. Okay. Well, thank I you, brother. I appreciate what you, you did. Glenn Osprey. You're welcome. Um, I just want a little bit of clarification. You were talking about the differing Greek translations and written at different time and non-harmonious uh, translation philosophy, for lack of a better term, and everything, and yet, you, you mentioned that at some point that that did come under a homogenous uh, thing. Is that the, is that standard accepted by the Jews of today? In other words, if you, if you quote uh, translations, will they accept uh, that, uh, that sudden, or is there, is there a standard Old Testament translation that they would accept in the Greek day? Now, if they would accept one, it would be one of the three competing translations I mentioned. So, so just as a, a brief sketch of the history there, the, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. Early Christians used that because most of them could not speak Hebrew. And as they used passages in the Septuagint like Isaiah 7.14 and the, the virgin birth of Christ to, to provide evidence for Christianity, the rabbinic Judaism started to separate themselves from that Greek translation. And so that they encouraged and commissioned their own scholars to produce new, uh, more literal translations of the Hebrew uh, Old Testament. And I, I don't think modern Judaism would, would think very kindly of the Septuagint. Okay. As, and as far as the collection is concerned, that, that really happened about 300 to 400 years after Christ, uh, Christ's death. And it was done by uh, what would become the Catholic Church. So is there, is there a specific Hebrew text that is harmoniously accepted by the Jewish community. In other words, if we were going to try to evangelize in Israel today, is there a translation, is there a translation that we can use in English to, that would be based on a, a Hebrew translation that they would consider to be conservative and accurate? Most of our translations they'd consider to be accurate. The Masoretic text was the product of uh, about 1,000 years of Jewish scholarship after Jesus died. And that's, that's the text that we use for most of our modern Hebrew translations, so or modern, modern translations of the Hebrew. I use my New American Standard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I do have one question. You mentioned Agloss in Hebrews uh, 13, uh, 2, uh, whenever he says, uh, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Or by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. 
Um, it is interesting that those two views, is this a human messenger, you know, practice hospitality, go down to the well, you know, invite these people home because they may be other preachers or would they be angelic creatures? You get mm -hmm. and those two translations have kind of vied through the years. Do you? I don't know if you looked at that, but that would be curious. Yeah, I haven't looked at it. All I can say is that I've personally thought that it was a reference back to Abraham entertaining the angels uh, when they visited him, but I, I'm not prepared to yeah, take a stance on that. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. If someone has a question, raise your hand. Uh, but and this is a little subjective, Matthew, but since, since Jesus and the apostles were not of the diaspora, and since much, well, all of Jesus' teaching was done in Israel and his southern ministry in, in Judea, would, would using the, uh, explain how he could get by if, if he were using the, uh, the, the Septuagint or Matthew's gospel, which people, you know, scholars say, well, he was writing to the Jewish community. Why would he use the Septuagint then? Uh, I think it's because of the existence of the diaspora. So there is linguistic evidence in the Bible itself. Uh, for example, the, the words that Mark records, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, that indicates that Jesus spoke Aramaic himself and, uh, and knew Hebrew. He was able to teach in synagogues in Judea, which would have been in Hebrew. Um, so the indication seems to be that they used Hebrew when speaking to Hebraic Jews. But once their, their views started to turn outward to the broader world, both of Hellenistic Jews as well as uh, non-Jews, Gentiles, then they started to, to use Greek as a language of choice. And so when the Gospel writers uh, prepared their, their accounts, they, they used Greek or they translated Jesus' words into Greek and chose appropriate translations in Greek to represent the teachings that Jesus uh, you know, offered while he was on the earth. If that answers your question. Yes. No. Okay. Very good. Are there any other questions? Um, another positive use of the Septuagint for today, I've read a little bit about, you may know more about it, is in the apologetic sense. That since the end, we know it was that all of the Hebrew train scriptures were translated into Greek at least a couple hundred years before Jesus. Uh, that all of those prophecies were done, and him fulfilling all of them would be not something he did, you know, that was written after he did. Anyway, you may have more information on that. Yeah, and that is a good point, is that all of these prophecies are represented in translations that almost certainly were produced hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Uh, for example, the book of Isaiah, and of course we have copies of the Hebrew book of Isaiah from before Jesus' birth. But all of this evidence works together to make a very strong apologetic case. Um, I appreciate that. Anyone else? Going once, twice? Do you have something that you want to say? Closing remarks. Well, I just want to thank everyone for being here and for the good discussion. I've, it's been a good first experience speaking at the preacher's study. Okay, very good. Well, you nailed it, and we're very, very happy. Okay.